current coronavirus pandemic has abruptly changed the way many of us live our lives. Businesses have either closed their doors, laid off employees, or have changed the way they do business altogether. Many Americans are struggling to pay bills and hoping they can return to work soon. And the U.S. government has begun issuing stimulus checks to those who qualify to help move the economy forward. Good evening and welcome to this month's edition of Rural America Live with AARP. I'm Christina Loren and we also welcome our listeners joining us on Rural Radio Sirius XM Channel 147. Tonight we're going to focus on Rural Money Matters and we have resources to help you manage your budget. We're also going to cover the latest from the IRS on the status of your stimulus check. And since we're talking dollars and cents, maybe you have a money saving tip to share with us. We'd love to to hear from you tonight. Our question of the month is, what are your money-saving tips during the COVID-19 pandemic? And you could be a winner tonight. We're giving away a Yeti cooler to five lucky on-air callers. If you are caller number one, three, six, eight, or 10, you will be a winner. And you don't need to be a member of AARP or over the age of 50 to win. But as a friendly reminder, you can only win one time each calendar year. So give us a call, 877-283-7570, and join the conversation. We're ready to take your phone calls now. I'm gonna give you that number one more time, 877-283-7570. Well, we're doing things a little bit differently in this era of COVID-19. Joining us now from their own homes, our friends from AARP, State Director for Oklahoma, Sean Boskul, and State Director for Wisconsin, Sam Wilson. Coming up a little bit later in the show, senior economist and author Chris Farrell is going to join us from Minnesota to share his insight on the future of the U.S. economy. He actually has some good news. We're also going to take your questions. Guys, we're all over the country tonight. It's great to have you back on the show. We certainly missed you. Let's start with an update on the stimulus payments that most Americans will get. We've heard that many are still waiting for that check to arrive by direct deposit or in the mail. Some are growing impatient at this point. Sean, how can our viewers learn more about the status of their check? And if you're on Social Security, are you eligible to get one? Thanks, Christina. The, the good part is millions of Americans have already received their $1,200 stimulus checks. And so there are a few recipients, if you're on Social Security or are, receive VA uh, benefits, um, you're likely to start getting those uh, checks, those those receipts, the middle of this month. So well, I know we're going getting towards the end of May and people are really concerned about those checks and they're coming in. The good news is if you file your tax returns, uh, you don't have to do anything else. So there's some good information if you go to irs.gov to check the status of your payment. And um, if you go to that website, there'll be a lot of great information there uh, to check your status if, you've not, if you have not received it as well. Um, we, we know for a lot of people that um, your, that benefit will be direct deposited into your che uh, checking account. Now, if you don't, many of those uh, re recipients will get a prepaid credit card uh, or uh, they'll be sent by mail, which of course will take longer. So for people that have not received it, it may be because it's getting mailed to you and they don't have, the IRS does not have your uh, banking information. Okay, you know, some people may actually be a little reluctant to enter their direct deposit information online. They're opting for that paper check instead. What do those who are waiting for that check to come into the mail need yeah. to know? Well, I think it's really important that, that, that we know what that check looks like. And, and we got to be uh, understand the scammers are out there. They're trying to take advantage of people because they know this high anxiety of uh, people are wanting to get in through checks. And it's a good time for scammers to get you under the ether of that anxiety of, of what to do. And the paper checks are, is a great way for scammers to take advantage of you. And we've got some great tips on what that check will look like in this upcoming video. If you are expecting a paper stimulus check, there are six things you should look for to make sure the check you received is authentic. Check the treasury seal. Older checks will say financial management service, but when those run out, the seal will say Bureau of the Fiscal Service. Look for bleeding ink. The treasury seal has security ink that will run and turn to red when moisture is applied. Does the check use microprint? It may look like just a line, but if you examine the back of the check under a magnifying glass, you should be able to read USA, 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 repeating in tiny print. Do you see a watermark? 
All stimulus checks are printed on watermarked paper that reads U.S. Treasury. It can be seen from both the front and back of the check when it is held to a light. Look at it under a black light. The check contains an ultraviolet pattern that's normally invisible. But if you hold it under a black light, you can see four lines that say FMS, or Fiscal Service, with seals on either side. And finally, make sure your check includes the president's name, not his signature, near the lower left side. If you don't see the words Economic Impact Payment, President Donald J. Trump, the check could be fake. Those are some great tips. Thank you for those, Sean. Sam, sadly, those who prey on the vulnerable have been up to no good during this pandemic. Fraudsters are using the current climate to take advantage of consumers. Is AARP seeing a spike in any one particular area? Well, unfortunately, Christina, we're seeing spikes in a lot of different areas. Some of it's super predictable. Uh, you see Medicare billing scams around coronavirus testing. You're seeing a lot of the, the frauds around uh, treatments, uh, people peddling sort of fly-by-night websites saying they've got the cure for the coronavirus. You know, some of that stuff's pretty predictable. Even as Sean said, the stimulus checks, there are people making promises they can get you your money faster than the government can send it. Of course, we know that's completely false. So some of it's predictable. We're also seeing, unfortunately, through the, from what we found through the Justice Department, was an increase in the grandparent scam. You know, we know people are at home, and a lot of those fraudsters are impersonating grandchildren, even children. A lot of people have lost their jobs. A lot of people are in financial straits. And they're using this opportunity to call on folks, play on their sort of feelings and fears, uh, and try to scam people out of their money. AARP's own Fraud Watch Network is seeing a big increase in tech scams. We know people are spending a lot of time on their computers these days, whether you're looking for COVID-19 information or you're just trying to play solitaire to pass the time. Uh, but those pop-up scams on your computers are more prevalent than ever. And as we like to say at AERP, if you can spot a scam, you can stop a scam. So people really need to be wary of what's popping up on their computers uh, and their telephones uh, with regard to anything related to COVID-19. All right, thank you so much. We are just getting this conversation started and we wanna bring you into it. We're gonna pause for a quick break, but when we come back, senior economist Chris Farrell will join the discussion and we wanna hear from you. You're a big part of this show. What steps are you taking to help keep your finances in line right now? Give us a call and let us know, 877-283-7570. We have Yeti coolers to give away to five lucky callers tonight. More Rural America Live with AARP right after this. The IRS is warning consumers that fraudsters are jumping into action as coronavirus stimulus payments go out to millions of Americans. Here is what you should know to keep your stimulus payment out of scammers' hands. If the IRS has your bank account information, your stimulus check will be directly deposited into your account. If they don't have this information, you'll get a paper check. You can check on the status of your payment at irs.gov. The actual IRS won't call, email, or text to ask you to verify personal or financial information. If you get communications like this, it's almost certainly a scam. Be skeptical, even if the caller ID says IRS. The IRS also won't ask you to pay a fee to issue or speed up a stimulus payment. Don't deposit a check if it shows that a fee has been taken out. It's most likely a fake check. For more tips, go to aarp.org slash fraudwatchnetwork and make sure to tune in to RFD TV the third Thursday of each month for Rural America Live with AARP. Welcome back to Rural America Live with AARP. Tonight we're focusing on rural money matters and we'd love to hear from you. We also have five Yeti coolers to give away tonight to lucky callers number one, three, six, eight, and 10. That could be you. Pick up the phone, the lines are open. Give us a call, 877-283-7570. 
and join the conversation. Those Yeti coolers known for being super durable. They can keep ice for five to seven days. Joining us once again, AARP State Director for Oklahoma, Sean Boskell, and AARP State Director for Wisconsin, Sam Wilson. Joining us now from St. Paul, Minnesota, economic journalist and author, Chris Farrell. Welcome to the show, Chris. And let our viewers know a little bit about your background, if you will. Oh, well, thank you for having me. I'm really honored. And yes, I have written a number of books about rethinking the second half of life, rethinking retirement to work longer well into their traditional retirement years, but doing things that you really want to be doing. And then as a journalist, I really cover two areas, the economy, the economy and personal finance. And I have been a journalist for about three decades. Wow, three decades, and I'm sure none of those looked like where we sit today. <laughs> oh, no. no like this, this. The word unprecedented is the right word. Absolutely, which is why we value having you on the show and getting your insight. As someone who is constantly in touch with how the economy is doing, are you seeing any signs that might be pointing in a positive direction? What areas do you think might do better than others as some of these states do start to reopen? Well, you are seeing some signs. If we went back to April, and April was just a terrible month, and you know, all the concerns was about the stimulus check, about you know the various programs, and the unemployment rate was just skyrocketing. And May hasn't been that much better. But now, as you mentioned, all the states are reopening or opening their economies, and they're doing it at different paces. Some are doing it slow, like in Minnesota, restaurants don't open until June 1st. In some other states, they've already opened. But everybody is experimenting. Everyone's on this learning curve, how to make this work. And if you're watching the economy and you're trying to figure out what's going on, watch the consumer and watch business. A lot of consumers are going to be wary, and they're going to want to make sure that the businesses are taking their safety into account. At the same time, a lot of businesses are wary and they want to protect their employees. They want their employees to be safe. So this is an economy that's going to start growing now and it is growing and it will continue to grow, but at a slow pace as everybody tries to figure out what does this world now mean where we're opening it up and we're going to be close to each other, we're going to be more engaged, but we also want to be safe. Okay, so Chris, you're not expecting that rapid V for our economy. I did not expect the rapid V <laughs> at all. No, okay. I just, I think what you really want to do is follow the consumer. What is the consumer comfortable with? And there was a Pew Research survey, and it was 68, 69% of consumers said that they were going to be cautious going out, shopping, doing some of their activities. Okay. You are going to be so helpful for the viewers across rural America tonight. Hope so. What kind of questions would you like to hear from them? Oh, you know, I'm well, part of, I one of the reasons why I love programs like this and what you're doing is what questions do people have? And we're always learning about that. But I would like to hear about what is um, the experience that you're having. You know, again, these economies are opening up. Things are relaxing a little bit. You know, what are you experiencing? What is your concern? And the other thing is, what have you learned during this period of time? This has been a, a difficult period of time, but we've all had that. What are we learning about ourselves? What are you learning about our family, about our money, about what our desires? What is it that we want to do going forward? Because in some sense, for many people, this has been a wake-up call. And so how do you think you're going to change the way you approach money in the future? It's mm, a good question. Many of us asking ourselves right now. 877-283-7570. Call in with your questions. We're going to go right to the phones. Nathan from Arkansas, you are our first caller and our first winner tonight. Go right ahead. Yeah, so my question, we got our first stimulus check. They're talking about a second. Do you all think there's going to be a second stimulus check come out? So the, the House of Representatives passed a $3 trillion uh, package, which was a com it's mostly like a relief package. And um, that's now subject to negotiation. There is discussion about a second set of stimulus checks. I'm not so sure if that's going to be the route that Congress will end up taking or whether they'll go more the route of shoring up some of the uh, unemployment insurance programs. So there is going to be money directed, but I am getting the sense that most likely it's going to be more targeted and it's going to be more targeted toward people who have lost their job, whether that's through unemployment insurance 
or some other program. But again, this is all going to be subject to negotiation, and the pressure on Congress to do something is going to grow, or at least to have another relief package. Okay, we're going to go back to the phones now. We have Tanya from South Dakota. Thanks for joining the conversation. Go right ahead. Yes, uh, my question is, we received an economic impact card today, and we are just curious if this is um, is a, a real payment or if this is some sort of a fraud um, type situation. That's a great question. Chris, do you know much, we talked a little bit on the front end about the prepaid uh, cards uh, in lieu of a paper check or direct deposit. Um, I know there's a certain look, the way that's that comes to you so we can make sure that it's not a fraud. Chris, do you have any more information on that? I do not, and I really don't want to give uh, misinformation. So I'm going to pass on this one. They are giving out the debit cards, but I don't know what are some, like with the check, that wonderful information you gave, you know, what to look at for the check. I couldn't do a comparable um, safety check for the debit card. You know, let's let's bring Sam in on the question here because Sam, you always have some great resources. When we find something fishy, what do we do with it? Is there somewhere we can take it, somewhere we can get some answers for our questions? Well, we do know that those um, uh, EI payments are coming out. There's about four million debit cards that are going to be issued, and they're going to people for whom the U.S. Right. Treasury did not have any bank account information available to them. You can go online. There are a number of news outlets that have um, posted exactly what the debit card looks like, so you can compare that to them. There is one particular bank that's issuing all four million of the debit cards, so you can go and check and make sure the financial institution information is the same there. So. It, uh, the, it is available on the internet. You can check for it, um, and it's been posted in numerous uh, news outlets. So if that's what you've received, just make sure you check, and otherwise you're going to use that like any other debit card. There should be, at a minimum for an individual, $1,200 loaded onto it. Uh, it could be up to $2,400 for a couple. And then if you have dependents under the age of 17, there could be additional $500 increments loaded onto there as well. The other thing I would say about the debit cards is um, there are phone numbers that should be included with the mailing that give you an 800 number that you can call and verify the balance on your debit card. So you can make sure that you know exactly how much you have there to spend. All right. Thank you for that, Tanya. We appreciate it. Victor from South Dakota, you are our next caller and you, sir, are a winner. Congratulations. Go right ahead. Yes. If my wife got a stimulus check, will I get one? I think that's a great question. Um, are, do you, have you filed your, do you file tax returns or is it filed jointly? I think that we actually lost the caller, but it's a good question. I myself got one, and so did my husband. For, for a couple, it should be $2,400. It depends. Um, um, maybe some, I'd like to get a little more information from him. I don't know if Chris or Sam would have anything else to add to that or not. Uh, you know, if they're, they're what we call filers and non-filer sections. So um, if people have filed tax returns, they automatically get the check. Uh, if this person happened to uh, receive benefits through Social Security or, or VA, those, those payments were delayed. Um, but um, he, he should still get that. So uh, probably need a little more information to answer that one. Yeah, 877-283-7570. That leaves a line open for you tonight. I'm going to give you that number one more time so you can get a pen. 877-283-7570. All right, Chris, we were talking about searching for glimmers of hope in the economy and something that stood out to me lately, gas prices are coming up. What do you expect there and how does that play out in the broader economy? So what I would expect with gas prices is they're going to continue to grow up as, as people start driving. I don't know if you've noticed in your area where there are a few more cars on the road, and it's not just one or two cars barreling down the road all by themselves, and more people are going to be commuting to work. So the increase in gasoline prices is a very healthy sign for our economy. Now, the oil and gas sector of our economy is going to continue to have a lot of difficulties. They're carrying a lot of debt. 
the price of oil is still way down. But what we're noticing when we go to the pump that there's a little bit of that increase that you just highlighted, that's a good sign. It's an economy that's starting again to, you know, to gain a little bit of momentum. Yeah, and we have to, of course, look at the long run picture here as well, because where is the $2 trillion for that initial spending bill coming from? And, and how do we pay that back? And then you have to consider as well the unpaid bills that people have right now, potential upside down loans. How is that when you take a look at the long run? I know it's a really difficult question right now, but when you take a look at the long run impacts of COVID-19, what do you see, Chris? So I think one of the things that we can say very strongly when is you're looking at households and, you know, household finances have been really strained and you can see the numbers about increased borrowing a credit card debt. And so I think for many people, what this boils down to, particularly if you're 50 years and over, is you're going to work longer, you're going to save more, and you're going to focus more on paying down your debts. Now, that's a really easy thing to say. But we all know that's really hard to do. And what kind of job are you going to be able to get? What, how, what kind of work will you, will you get in terms of pay? And then saving longer and the budgeting and paying down your debts. But that's one of the real impacts on household finances that comes out of this. And so I think we need to build that into our expectations as we're thinking about, you know, with the aging process and continuing to contribute to this economy and being a productive part of this economy, work longer, save more, borrow less. That's a recipe for success in this consumer-driven economy. Okay, we are going to go back to the phones. Manuel from South Carolina, you're up next. Thanks for joining us. So my, I don't really have a question, but my input is uh, right now during the COVID, it's really difficult to find good food and even save money. But my recommendation has always been to buy local and uh, small farms. My favorite in Greenville is uh, Cedar Rock Farm. You can get some fresh veggies, some really good food. You're helping out local business. You're helping out that local economy, and you're keeping jobs within the neighborhood. And I just wanted to let the viewers know I think that was a good, a good uh, snippet of information to write out this COVID economy. You know, just just to add to that, um, you know, I was talking with Oklahoma Cattlemen's Association and the disruption in the in the food supply. You know, people are really concerned about how they get their meat, and I was really pleased to see that uh, some of the, the associations in agriculture were creating their own list of where you can buy your produce or your beef uh, directly with the farmers. Um, and so I think that's a great opportunity. This coronavirus is people are looking for homegrown, fresh uh, fruits and vegetable. And when the disruption with the food chain, uh, people are looking to local and the way we can connect people to local producers, you know, is, is a great part and a, and a, a good part for helping our agriculture community. All right. Thank you for that call, Manuel. We're going to go to Tennessee. Now Dwayne joins the conversation. Go right ahead, Dwayne. I was just wondering, at, uh, you know, at the end of the year or, for instance, maybe next year, is this something we're going to end up having to pay back? If the question's about the $1,200 stimulus checks, uh, that that is, you do not have to pay that amount back, the $1,200. Um, um, that is given to you uh, as a benefit, and um, you will not have to pay that uh, amount back. Good question. Thanks for that, Dwayne. I appreciate that. Okay, Chris, we're going to bring you back into the conversation. You're an economic journalist. I'm going to put you on the spot for a moment. How have your spending huh. habits changed throughout this COVID-19 era? Oh, I think like a lot of people, uh, I've been focusing on saving more and watching where my money is going. And, you know, sort of, you know, one of the things I've been doing is also going through drawers and cleaning things out and sort of paring things down. And so I would call this as a time for embracing thrift, embracing frugality, not in this sort of penny pinching way, but thinking about, well, what do I really value? Where do I really want to spend my money? And what sort of businesses do I want to support? Like uh, many people that I know, Sean had mentioned about uh, local farmers and also about local businesses. We've all become aware of our local businesses and how fragile they are and how much they bring to our community and we want them to stay in business. And so like many people, I'm spending my dollars as much as possible 
at a local business and supporting that local business. And I think it's you know good for our community and it's good for the health of the country. But as an individual, I would say that I'm actually saving more. Wow. Wow, I'm a little surprised to hear that. All right, I appreciate that, though. We're going to go to Tennessee. Marty is our next caller. Thanks for joining the conversation. Go right ahead, Marty. Okay, uh, y'all were talking about the scams and frauds that are happening due to COVID. And uh, we, I was, I was telling the person I talked to before that there's a website to go on to check scams and frauds for not only COVID but other things. It's called BBB.org. And I was telling uh, the person, too, that right after uh, March 3rd, the town I'm from in Tennessee, we were hit by a tornado, mm. and we had quite a few fatalities, and that hit. And then right after that, all the mm. COVID things happened. Uh, I know what that's... Mm. And... And uh, so w our community had to recover from the tornado, and then the COVID hit. And so uh, we have a logo in our town. It's mm -hmm. called Putnam Strong, Cookful Strong, and it's helped our community uh, get through this trying time. And it's also helped people to understand about COVID. And our mayors go online uh, three days a week every day to give us an update on the COVID and talk about frauds and other things that consumers need to know and to get help for folks. And that was my comments. We knew uh, our part of the country, we're used to the tornadoes as well, and our hearts and thoughts were sure with you during that. And it's kind of a double whammy with the coronavirus for sure. And Sam, uh, you know, there's a lot of good resources out there about frauds and scams, how to get updated. Uh, you want to share any of that information that we have? Absolutely. And, you know, the, the Better Business Bureau, which is what BBB um, org would be directing people to uh, is a great national partner. They track a lot of the businesses and complaints of businesses. Um, I think they have a scorecard that people can check in on particular businesses. And if there, you know, if there have been reports about uh, um, poor business practices, that's a great place to go. We always talk about our fraud watch network at AERP, and and our fraud watch uh, tools online also track frauds around the country in real time. You can enter those for your location. So if there is a grandparent scam or there is a tech scam that you've been exposed to. Uh, in your community, you can log that right there, and people in your community will know exactly what's going on. I want to go back to one other comment, though, about the mayors uh, giving updates three times a week. And I know, particularly if you've been hit by a tornado and COVID simultaneously, that's a whole nother ball of wax. But I think there's been a really great connection between residents and communities and the city leadership. I think a lot of times that relationship is uh, almost taken for granted, and the communication isn't as uh, great as it can be. And I think we've really seen sort of this outpouring from city leaders reaching out to residents, making sure they have the services they need, whether that be food or rental assistance or utility assistance. And I think it's really changed some of the dynamic in a lot of communities where the residents are certainly appreciating all that the city government and county governments are doing for them. And the city and county governments are stepping up to the plate and doing a great job of keeping their residents informed. So I think that's a great uh, some, a great tale to come out of all of this that we're going through is perhaps better communication between city leadership and its residents all across the country. Such a good point. A great point there, Sam. And you know what, Marty? Congratulations. You are a winner of a Yeti cooler tonight, and we still have more to give away. I want to give you that number so you can call and join our conversation, possibly be a winner. 877-283-7570. Back to the phones now. Cliff from Alabama, you're next. Go right ahead. I received a, uh, a stimulus check based on my 2018 tax return. Um, my wife was deceased in August of 2019. So what should I do? Should I return the 1200 or should what should I do? That's a that's a great question. In fact, uh if you go to irs.gov, um, they do uh, suggest you return a, uh, the $1,200 check back on a deceased 
spouses. So there is a process if you go to irs.gov to return the $1,200. Okay. And uh, God bless you. I'm sorry that that happened. And our thoughts and prayers are with you. Those are, those are yeah. hard calls to take, but you know what? We got to answer those calls. That's life. And especially right yeah. now, this is hard for everybody. Yeah. Okay. We're going to go to Cl Larry, Larry from Oklahoma, your home state, Sean. Larry, go right ahead. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Hey guys. How are y'all? Hey, uh, I've got a question about, uh, got a loan yeah. on an ag loan for $4,000 and uh, about a week and a half ago and still haven't received any check yet or anything. I call in every day and nobody knows anything about it. Uh, mm. Got any questions how we can find out some information on that? Or There's a couple of things. You can check your payment by going to irs.gov if, if you're specifically talking about uh, the stimulus check. Um, and so, um, you know, if you filed your tax returns, um, that should automatically go to you, but you can check your status. And it could be if, if they don't have your banking information, it could be by, by mail and check, which would take longer for you to get. Now, um, you talked about an ag loan. Now, I, I know there are opportunities uh, through the EIDL uh, emergency industry loans that will be available for uh, agribusinesses with less than 500 employees. And that uh, application through the SBA is open online. That would give you a $10,000 cash advance. And um, that opened up the first week of May. So that's a new opportunity for you. Uh, these EIDL loans for agriculture businesses, I would uh, encourage you to check that out as well. Uh, and I know that the PPP program is also could be an opportunity if you have an ag, agri business, um, even if you're self-employed, uh, sole contractor, you could still qualify for the uh, payment protection uh, plan, and it's usually administered through your local bank. All right, and you are a winner. We appreciate that call. Thank you so much. We are going to go back to the phones in just a moment. We know that we have somebody waiting on the line for us right now. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we have one more Yeti cooler to give away. So give us a call at 877-283-7570. Join the conversation tonight. Call in with your money-saving tips in this new COVID-19 era, or let us know some of the challenges, the financial challenges that have been created by the pandemic. We want to hear from you. Join our conversation tonight, 877-283-7570. More Rural America Live with AARP right after this. Fraudsters continue to flood consumers with pitches for bogus coronavirus-related remedies, hard-to-find protective gear, and financial help. Here are three coronavirus-related scams to watch out for. Beware of in-demand product offers. Scammers are claiming in robocalls, text messages, and emails to have secret reserves of masks, test kits, and other scarce supplies. Watch out for bogus cures. From teas and essential oils to vitamin C therapies, fraudsters are hawking unproven treatments in ads, websites, and social media posts. Be on alert for financial phonies. Crooks like to impersonate banks or government agencies and offer help with bills, benefit payments, or student loans. If you can spot a scam, you can stop a scam. For more tips, go to aarp.org slash fraudwatchnetwork and make sure to tune in to RFT TV the third Thursday of each month for Rural America Live with AARP. Stay alert. Watch for all the financial scams going on in this challenging time. Don't deal with anybody but a trusted family member or a business associate, banker, lawyer, financial advisor. It's way too easy to get caught up in today's unreliable information and enticing offers. Make sure you know who you're dealing with in these troubled times. This is good advice. Listen. I'll listen to the Oak Ridge Boys any day. Welcome back. We have a Yeti cooler to give away, so we're going to go straight to the phones. Number to call. You can still get in on that Yeti cooler, potentially, 877-283-7570. But we've got to go to Michelle. She's been hanging on the line for us in Arkansas. Thank you for your patience. Go right ahead. 
Yes, I hope you all are having a good evening. Um, my question uh, goes back to the economic Thanks. side of things, and I was just curious uh, what you think uh, interest rates are going to do as far as, you know, loans. Uh, credit cards, that kind of thing. Do you think they're going to go up? Do you think they're going to go down or stay the same? Chris, you want to take that one? Uh, do you have any looking at that crystal ball? Well, I have to do all the caveats about, uh, you know, forecasting can be hazardous to your wealth. But if we look at the current situation right now, where we are, there's a lot of downward pressure on prices because there's just so little economic activity. Now we're starting to expand. And earlier we were talking about, you're seeing a, you know, a little tick up in gasoline prices, but interest rates are down. Interest rates are probably going to stay down for the foreseeable future. Under normal circumstances, as the economy gains some real momentum and we start growing a little bit better, maybe we have a vaccine and people are feeling a lot more comfortable, you would expect a rise in interest rates. But we went through a period of time after the 2008, 2009 Great Recession, the global credit crunch, where we saw very little movement in interest rates except for you know staying stable or a little bit down. And there was all these forecasts, well, as the economy grows, interest rates have got to go up. They didn't actually go up that much for a long period of time. And even when they did, it wasn't that much. So my guess is the downward pressure on interest rates is real. The downward pressure on interest rates is here to stay and that at some point things will change before the foreseeable future and that with the knowledge that we have right now, I would expect interest rates to stay very low. We've heard that from quite a few experts recently, so you're right on the same page. I got to ask you this. We have seen the wildest ride in the stock market. Have you ever seen anything like this, Chris? And what do you expect? Are these wild swings here to stay? Oh, they are here to stay. And we're all sitting there, this divergence, because, you know, think about the, the, the unemployment rate. I mean, it's 14.7%, but we know it's much higher than that, and, you know, 20, 23%. And, you know, we, this economy went into a coma. And yes, the stock market went down for a while, but now it's just been, you know, going up and there's, then it goes down, then it goes back up. I think what you're seeing in the stock market are a couple of things. One is, you know, the, 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 the indexes that we look at, like the Dow, and the Standard Poor's 500, they reflect the global economy. These are global businesses. And so part of it reflects what's happening to their business around the world and not just here in the US. And there is something going on where, you know, people keep thinking, maybe we're gonna get a vaccine, maybe we're gonna get a vaccine a little bit sooner, maybe we'll get through this valley a lot faster than we thought. Um, so there's enthusiasm in the stock market. It makes me really wary. I, I, I tend to look at this economy and I say, there's a lot of damage to this economy. A lot of this damage is going to take us a long time to get out of this. But the stock market seems to be wanting to anticipate the, the future very quickly. Wow. Yeah. Boy, that's going to be something to get used to, although we've certainly been used to it over the past six months. OK, next up is Roger from Kentucky. Roger, you are a winner tonight. Thanks for joining us. Go right ahead. Um, I'm concerned about the economy, and um, I, I went into a store the other day to, to buy two small steaks. And two small steaks were over over thirty dollars. Wow! And are they taking advantage of the people? Well, I think that's uh, uh, there's a lot of legis uh, members of Congress asking that same question about price gouging on that end, and um, from the producer. <laughs> Uh, side of things, uh, that's that's a real heartburn when com cattle prices are so low. But you know, I think the disruption, the COVID nineteen, and the processing facilities has really made it um, uh, th that disruption in the, uh, especially in the in the in the meat uh, uh, plan. There, it, it's really increased prices for for the consumer. And so, uh, earlier I talked about where people are also looking at um, through the Oklahoma Cattle uh, Cattlemen's Association or through your local cattle associations of the list of local producers that could maybe sell you beef from their farm. 
that you can get processed that, that, you know, may, may be a cheaper way option for you to go. But uh, a lot of factors contributed to it. But COVID was the main factor that disrupted the processing and uh, really jacked up the prices for the consumer at the supermarkets. All right. And hey, Chris, maybe you can give us a, a basic supply and demand economics <laughs> update on what's happening, because <laughs> we know consumers have made it known more now than ever before that they want their beef. And so the demand is there, but the supply is not reaching the market. So generally speaking, maybe you can brush us up on some good old fashioned Econ 101. <laughs> Well, you know, just off of what Sean was saying there, you you know, you have these disruptions in these supply chains. And so with the disruption the, the disruptions to the supply chain, but the demand, as you mentioned, Christina being strong, you would expect higher prices. You also have a lot of the grocery stores, their costs have increased, the costs mm -hmm. of masks for their employees, the costs of people waiting out in a line outside and letting only a few people into the store at one time. I mean, and they're cleaning down so much. So on the one hand, the grocery stores, their costs have gone up. On the other, you have this classic supply demand situation, and therefore you would expect slightly higher prices uh, at the at the grocery store. And that's exactly what we're seeing. You know, and Sam, I want to bring you into this conversation because you're in Wisconsin in dairy country. We've seen a similar situation with our dairy producers and milk not being able to get to the grocery stores as well. What's it been like for you throughout this COVID-19 experience just in Wisconsin representing AARP? Share a little bit of your experience there. Well, I'll tell you, the dairy industry is absolutely devastated. I mean, there has been longer than a decade decline in family-owned dairy farms in the state of Wisconsin, uh, which has just uh, increased precipitously uh, through the inability of any of those dairy producers to find a market. Um, there are tons of stories across the state of milk just being dumped by the thousands of gallons, uh, basically uh, not being able to distribute any cheeses. Um, it, it's incredible what's happening on the ground here. Now, I know there are some efforts, particularly state efforts uh, through state government, to provide some assistance to some of those dairy producers. And they certainly are top of mind for all of our members of Congress. We've had teletown halls with uh, the majority of our delegation over the last month, and they all brought up uh, dairy producers uh, and the strain that's going on, particularly for the small producers. So uh, I'll tell you what, that people are, you know, making creative solutions. Sean said it, Chris said it. They're trying to find ways for the, sum the consumer can go straight to the producer. Uh, and some of those products are able to do that. But um, the, we need those bigger, broader commercial markets to come back before dairy production um, can actually find a market right now. But it's it's really devastating what we're seeing in Wisconsin. Absolutely. It's so hard to see what's, what our producers are going through. Happy to see that they're getting a little bit of federal aid right now. We're going to go back to the phones. Suzanne from Iowa, you are our next caller. Go right ahead. Yes, I just wanted to mention a helpful hint. And then I have a question about the stimulus check. Um, I think people can plant more gardens. Myself, I am. And I've just noticed uh, we live in the country, and people that have never planted gardens for many, many years, they have tilled up their yards and are planting gardens. And also, we have received our stimulus check, and is it going to be taxable? So on the stimulus check, it will not be taxable. So they're, they're fine on that. And... By the way, the gardening thing, that's absolutely fascinating because uh, I've also noticed near me there's a community garden, and I have never seen so many people using the community garden, and it's very heartening to see that. And yes, uh, so many people are growing some vegetables, and this is a really good trend. I think it's part of this be local, support local, do a little DIY, but also support your local businesses. And uh, there's just really something about growing your own vegetables. All right. Thank you for that call, Suzanne. Peter is our next caller from California. Go right ahead, Peter. It's Peter. Hi, Peter. Thanks for joining us. Go right ahead. Okay. I just was planning on buying a new car, 
And so I was just wondering if this is a good time. Chris, I think that goes back to the question about interest rates and maybe uh, car inventory on dealership lots. Uh, What does your economics crystal ball say about that? (laughs) Okay, so I haven't been in the market to buy a car lately. But what I can say is there's a lot of inventory. Rates are down. Uh, like the dealers have been suffering, vehicle sales really did plunge. When you looked at the April sales and just that dramatic plunge in retail sales during April, vehicle sales was part of being way down. So was clothing. Clothing was way down. So if I were in the market for a car, I'd be going to the dealers and saying, you know, I'm interested in buying. What kind of a deal can you make for me? Because this is a time to be cutting a deal for them. Boy, you can sure get a deal online shopping for clothes right now. I can tell you that much. And hey, when you do so, you are supporting our cotton producers out there. I love having this conversation. We still have time for maybe one or two more calls. 877-283-7570 is the number to call and join the conversation. And Sam, we didn't get a chance to talk to you too much tonight. You did mention the town halls. Tell us more about these virtual town halls and how helpful they have been for everybody who's been attending? Well, it's been a really great resources, a resource, and we've got tremendous feedback. You know, there's sort of two sets. The one I really want to highlight is our national teletown halls. Um, you can find out information about those national teletown halls by going to AERP's coronavirus landing page, which is at www.aerp.org slash coronavirus. And on there, you will see the weekly teletown halls that we're holding. You do not have to be an AERP member to join them. Anybody can dial in. But we've had public health experts. Uh, We've had um, long-term care service experts. We've had caregiving experts. We've had fraud experts. It's a really fantastic way for you every week to get the latest information particularly the information that impacts the 50 plus population. So um, we really recommend a lot of uh, those resources that are on there. The other thing that we have on that resource page is our friendly caller program. We know that social isolation is a huge issue right now for a lot of folks. Uh, If you're living alone or maybe perhaps they're away from loved ones, you know, we've all been sort of separated from each other. Uh, This is a program you can sign up to get a weekly call. Uh, someone, an AERP volunteer, a trained volunteer will call you, check in on you, make sure everything is okay, uh, have somebody to talk to for a little while, even if it's just to talk about the weather. So some really great resources that have sprung up through this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, and they're services that anyone can take advantage of uh, through AERP's um, website and through other AERP services. Uh, People have just been loving them, and for good reason. Okay, we are to that time in the show where I get your final thoughts. And Chris, let's start with you. You know, we're going through this collective stress right now. A lot of it is burdened by the economy. What are your final thoughts for us tonight? You know, this is a hard time, and I'm not minimizing it at all. But I also think it's one of those times to think about Who am I? What am I? What do I want to do? This economy is going to open up more. Uh, It's a little way this has been a wake-up call. What do you want to do next? What is your encore? What is it that has been your passion? You've had some idea in the back of your mind. You've been thinking about, hey, I might want to try that. So take advantage of this difficult, hard time, not minimizing it, to think about what do I want to do next? What would give me meaning? Beautiful. All right. Final thoughts, Sam? Well, I, I want to end this call. We, we've t- covered a lot of ground ar- around coronavirus and economic impacts, but uh, it is Memorial Day weekend. Uh, and we, lest we forget about the sacrifices that have been made by those before us um, and given their lives uh, for the safety and security of this country, uh, I just want to make sure that we Uh, Give proper due to all the veterans out there uh, and their families uh, that are supporting them for everything that they've given to our country, uh, the sacrifices they've made, and we we salute you and appreciate everything that you've done. So. Absolutely. Freedom is not free, and we thank everybody for their sacrifice. Okay, final thoughts. Sean, it's you. 
Well, great. Thank you again. And, and just to add on what Sam had said, it's also May is also Military Appreciation Month. So it's a double opportunity to uh, recognize our loved ones in uniform. And, and please visit ARP.org slash coronavirus for, for additional resources. And uh, thanks for having us this month for a, a very informative uh, conversation. All right. We want to leave you with an uplifting story. Take a look. With college campuses closed, we've been able to, you know, fill in during this pandemic for the older volunteers who normally do Meals on Wheels, and it's really given us an opportunity to help out and feel good about what we're doing. The organization means so much to me, from the route work I do to the people I meet. It's given sort of like a new lease on life for some of these younger college students. are seeing a huge increase and anticipating an even greater increase in demand for home delivered meals. Things obviously have changed considerably and we're pivoting in real time to adjust to this unprecedented time and in uncharted waters. It's just given us an opportunity and it feels really good.